So I'm Erin Hodges, and we're going to talk about using R with high performance Fortran on a Windows laptop. So this is a little bit different from some of the people that are using the uh, supercomputers, but it's, a, it's sort of interesting. Okay. All right, why isn't this going? There we go. So I'm going to have a brief introduction. And what I actually built this for is ordinary Krieging for spatial temporal data. And the package is called RMPI Fort. We'll have a brief theoretical background, an empirical background, and look at the study that we did to compare existing methods to this new method. Then we'll talk about uh, how this is actually put together with some code examples, and I'll have a brief conclusion. So R has been a language of choice in the last 20 years for statistical computing. Uh, contributors have actually put together literally thousands of libraries and packages with various kind of uh, applications. However, R does occasionally suffer from problems with data size and speed. So we're going to turn to Fortran to extend the capabilities, and R is currently using Fortran 95. So several years ago, I was lucky enough to be able to work on supercomputers for a geostat research on regular ordinary Krieging. And this was just with spatial data. So essentially, you've got a response variable, and it's a function of longitude and latitude. And I worked on uh, Stampede, the original Stampede at Texas uh, Advanced Computing Center. And um, I also worked with Bridges at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. But even at the time, I thought, what if you have a laptop that has uh, a gaming card and um, this is multi cores? Would that work? Would that help speed up if you didn't have access to the supercomputers? Okay, so now I get this question a lot. Why are you using Fortran? Why not C or C++? Um, most of the time when people use different languages within R, they're using C and C++. But how this came about, when I started using the supercomputer, I started with C and R RMPI. And I didn't get very good speed up, and I was a little disappointed. So a colleague of mine said, well, you know Fortran. Um, why don't you give it a shot and see what happens? So I decided to start working with it, and I started seeing these great uh, time reductions. All right. So I constructed this R package with my high-performance tools on Windows, and I'm using MPI and OpenACC. So R actually has an existing function, uh, Krieg ST, for the spatiotemporal. And see what happens when you add this, essentially you're adding a whole different dimension onto your spatial analysis. So what I did is look at my new package. I ran comparisons on a MacBook Air and a Windows laptop using those existing functions. And this is kind of fun. In the last couple of days, um, uh, Microsoft has come out with WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux, and I was able to use Ubuntu to try to replicate this. And until, until now, uh, the WSL could not access the graphics cards, but now it can. So this, this is just kind of a little bit of uh, extra fun in the last few days. So I did get some surprisingly good results. Of course, being a statistician, you can't escape uh, a little bit of theory. So we've got our response variable, our z, and we have z at different locations and times. So our goal is to produce a grid of interpolated values in space and time. And for those of you that are familiar with least squares and such, this is like a weighted regression model. So of course we have our first order stationarity and our second order stationarity for the covariance matrix. For those of you that are familiar with time series, this is like autocovariance. All right, so within both spatial and spatiotemporal processes, there's something called a semivariogram, and that aids in selecting an appropriate model. So we're going to use that semivariogram to help us build the covariance matrix. So here's just a little bit we have something called a nugget. We have something called a sill where the semivariance level levels off. And the range is the horizontal distance 
from zero to the point where the sill levels off. All right, so what we're gonna do in our empirical background, we're going to get estimates for the sill nugget range and something called an anastrophe parameter using the standard R functions. So we're gonna use this in our new part and in the, uh, when we use our comparisons. So now we can calculate the mean, the covariance matrix, and the predicted values with our high performance tools. And that's where we're going to see our nice speed up. So here's our overall sample mean. In ordinary Kriegen, you calculate an estimate of the sample mean as opposed to different kinds of Kriegen. We have um, the inverse of our covariance matrix, and this is the big time filler. And we're using a model called the sum metric model. And it contains a uh, spatial part, a temporal part, and a joint part that actually looks at spatial and temporal together. It has that uh, value K, which is our anastrophe. And we'll talk about that again a little bit later. Here's our equation for our one period forecast. But this is very easily generated from multiple points in space and time. All right, so what we're going to do is take a look at uh, the Irish wind data set. And this is very common, commonly used in geostatistics. It was discussed uh, in some detail in Pabesma 2004. The data originally appeared in Hazlitt and Raftery in 1989. So we have daily wind speeds at 12 stations around Ireland. The data run from January of 1961 till December of 1978. So we start with our three month, a one year, and then increase one year increments till we get to December of 1969. So I ran that existing process on a two core MacBook Air and a six core Windows laptop. So on my new process, I'm still using a six core Windows laptop, but we're gonna take R and compile it with open blahs. So those of you that use Linux, you've got your open blahs already there. In Windows, it doesn't have it, so it has to be brought in. And we'll, again, we'll talk about that more in a little bit. So I've actually rerun the study within the last two weeks to get with uh, our version four. And here again, our last minute update. Uh, on Tuesday, I was running the WSL with Ubuntu on our version 4.0.2. So our output from this it's going to be a spatial temporal grid with interpolated values. So how do we use that? And it's actually very nice. We can take this output and write it to a KML file, which uh, Google Earth runs on. And what will happen is um, you will get, you'll start out with a static graph, but you'll see a slider across the top. And if you hit the slider, you can see the points change over time. And that's uh, pretty interesting. All right, so let's take a look at our results. So these are the time in minutes that it took to analyze the data. So the max struggled from the beginning. With the three months, it was still much higher than the other uh, Windows processes. In one year, it jumped up to 5.88 minutes, over an hour in two years, and then it couldn't even handle the remaining uh, data set. Okay, so the Windows, based on the existing process, started out nicely started to shoot up again as we went to one year, two years, just short of 114 minutes on three years, and again, couldn't handle the remaining years. All right, so Windows based on our new process, this turned out pretty nicely. Um, we got up to uh, 1969, and uh, so we just see small jumps as we go through this. So the process is indeed very nice. So that's nine years of daily data from 12 stations. Okay, so the WSL, it's fairly comparable to the, using the new method on just regular windows. The only problem is once it hit four years, it couldn't handle anymore. And I'm thinking, this is an evaluation copy. So I'm thinking once we get, uh, more more stabilized version that we will be able to pick up some more of those years but it actually performed nicely for as much as it got okay so as nice as this looks in the in the table it's even better uh, in a graph you can really see the stark differences 
between the Mac and the old windows. And then the new windows, again, the WSL is going to be superimposed and it will stop at year four, whereas the new windows goes out to year nine. Okay, so what tools do we need? So of course, we need our NVIDIA graphics card. We need our PGI Community Edition compiler. We need our CUDA drivers from the NVIDIA website. We need Microsoft MPI. So um, the PGI compiler has a version of Open MPI uh, for Linux. It does not have one for Windows, so that's why we need that. And we also need the free version of Visual Studio, which helps support the Community Edition compiler. All right, so the nice thing about this, everything can be done with free software. So where do we start? We look at Abraham Adler's website on building the open blahs for Windows machine. So that actually is a fairly long and um, kind of picky process. You have to make sure you get every line correct. You will get a file that reflects uh, your processor. So mine has Haswell. Some people will have Sandy Bridge and so on, the Halem. All right. Then we compile R from source using that open blast on Windows. All right. So here's something that's sort of interesting. When you compile an R package on Windows using foreign programs, which is how they refer to Fortran and C and such, you typically use something called a make bars file. And that contains the compiler directions and the flags. However, on Windows, when you're using the MPI compiler, that make vars doesn't work. So what you need to do is actually kind of go under the hood in R and look at the make con file, which is in one of the top directories in R. You still put in your uh, compiler flags and your um, like say your MPI flags and your CUDA flags for the uh, make file. And once you do that, you can create your package. Then you have to make sure you return the MakeCon uh, back to its usual state. Uh, what, next time you go in to uh, put in new packages, it has to be in that original state. Um, if you're just doing a single program in OpenACC or MPI, you don't need to go through all of those hoops. Um, you can actually use the PGI compiler from the command line. Okay, so how does OpenACC work? I'm sure you all know. Um, we've got our Fortran with our OpenACC directives, and we're moving our data from the host to the GPU for our quick processing. Okay, so here's another question I get. How complicated is our OpenACC? So here we have our loops to calculate Euclidean distance just basic stuff. All we need are two statements, two directives, our loop and our end loop. And even if I were to compile this on uh, a system that doesn't have the NVIDIA, it's going to see those directives as comment statements because the leading character is an exclamation point. So I'm going to use our OpenACC subroutines to produce all those covariance matrices. And something very interesting in R, you can't pass a matrix or get one back. What you have to do is take your uh, matrix and split it out into an extended vector. You make all your operations and then bring it back as a vector and then rebuild the matrix once you're back into R. Okay, so here's a quick open ACC example. We're just having a nice little loop. Um, that takes our index and adds two. What we're really interested in is the time that it takes. Um, we're going to uh, we uh, dyn load our DLL. We put together uh, a vector of zeros that is 1024 to the squared, and then we run our program. And our uh, time was just 0 0.002. So this is again one of the nice things that I like about it. It's very straightforward. And um, it's really not complicated at all once you see what's going on. Okay. So then in our next step, we're going to start using our MPI. When we use uh, MPI with R, we're going to use R functions that actually call subroutines where the, uh, the MPI directives are set. So here's our initialization function. One line, okay, return 
use your Fortran, call um, the FINET. And just a quick look at the subroutine. Um, one interesting statement, everything else is just basic um, baby code, if you will. Something that is uh, a little different, we have this exclamation point dex statement that identifies the subroutine to R. If you don't use it, even if you compile the, the package, R doesn't see it. Okay, so let's talk about our main function in our process. That's the inversion of that final covariance matrix. So what we're going to do for that, we're going to use a package called PBD DMAT. That uses MPI, and that package was actually created by George uh, Ostro. Osterhoff, uh, Wei Sum Chan, and Drew Schmidt at the University of Tennessee. So what's going to happen, it's going to split the matrices into sub-matrices based on our process rank. And there is actually a special structure for these large matrices. So in this last segment, when we had the nine years, we're inverting a 39,000 by 39,000 matrix on a laptop. And combined with all the other calculations, as mentioned, that only takes 35 minutes, which really isn't too bad. Okay, here's a little MPI example. We load our, our package. We load another DLL, which we'll see in a minute. This is a very common uh, type of example. You're just doing an integral. Um, in this particular set, we're integrating um, x to the fifth from zero to one, and we're using the trapezoid method. So the good stuff in here, you're going to call your initialization. Again, you're using your R wrapper. We get the, uh, the universe size, and we get the rank size. Okay. And the rest of the stuff is just finding steps. The nice thing about this, we're going to use that sum1.dll. That's going to take the pieces of the integral. And as you'll see in a minute, it's going to use a function called MPI reduce. When we get the total value, when rank is equal to one, we get our final result. And here's the subroutine. Here again, very basic code, and we're just gonna use that call reduce. We're gonna use a sum and we'll get our grand total. All right, on Windows you use MPI exec as opposed to MPI run. We're going to use the R script function. We call our, uh, our R function and here's our final result, which is, of course, 0.1666. All right. So our conclusions, our speed up was uh, unexpectedly good. The data size was also better than I thought. I never thought we'd get into nine years. Um, I'd actually like to try this on a laptop, laptop that has more core and more memory. And I'm waiting impatiently to get a more stable version of the double uh, WSL. All right, uh, thank you again. Thank you for the opportunity to present and thank you for your brave souls who lasted till the end of the day. Um, are there any questions, please? Uh, thank you very much, Erin, for this talk. There's actually one question I have. Okay. Here. It is, uh, since this seems to target single node machines, i.e. laptops, shouldn't we rather be using threads, OpenMP, instead of MPI, or am I missing something? No, actually, that's a very good question. Um, you can use Open OpenMP. What I was trying to do was replicate my original study from the spatial data set and uh, expand it to the spatial temporal that that's actually a very good question and probably uh, may work more effectively okay um, another question do you know why your original program was in C in C was not as fast as the Fortran program I really don't um, I didn't get into the I got a little bit into the code and it seemed to be all right but um, the person that I was talking to was saying, explained to me that Fortran actually is better in faster results. And um, that's how I happened to switch to that. So I know, okay. yes, that's not a good answer, but yeah. But a good choice. <laughs> Have you considered using a dual boot machine to run Ubuntu directly? Then you don't uh, have to. Um, I have. 
I actually messed up another, uh, another laptop with using a dual boot. So that's why I didn't want to get into it again and mess up another laptop. Okay. But yeah, again, these are all wonderful points. Thank you.